Hey guys, don't forget to check out the Street Cop Training Conference 2023, April 23rd through the 28th, Nashville, Tennessee, the Gaylord at Opry. What a center, what a place. We have amazing speakers, amazing training, five of the most impactful days of your career. Check it out at streetcop.com. You do not want to miss out. There is a room code available for a discounted room. Sign up now at streetcop.com. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino, and today I'm with me, uh, one of our top instructors. I said this last time, and I'll say it again. We did our first podcast episode a couple weeks ago. People loved it. We got a lot of reviews, and uh, I said, Tommy Brooks, you got to get back on the podcast. So, none other than the legend himself. Yeah, maybe yeah. Not, maybe not for the police work, according to him, but it is yeah, yeah. his personality and the consistency <laughs> in the entertaining fashion of his training programs where of course as soon as you taught the first class here people i'll never forget this guy goes hey that that fucking class i mean dude he's so good he's the best instructor well you know you're good too but i mean he's very good so um i actually was thrilled that you upstaged me on the i i i I, I appreciate it i mean you and i talked about this last time we did the podcast and kenny was with us and you know you were calling it we're having a a humble off you called it you know it it, it's not untrue though it's um like I said, this is all things I think. Yeah, I know you're a great, you're a great instructor. That's what's not untrue. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm, how about this? I, I work real hard at it. I work real, real yeah, hard at it. So I, it's, it's not luck yeah, at this point. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's funny. I did a, um, I did a thing a while back and I had to show someone something about the work and it had to do with, um, uh, the background of it doesn't matter so much, but anyway, I ended up going like the metadata. I made this sound like it was recently. I'm sorry. This is actually a little bit ago, but anyway, I went into the little, there's a file options and history. You can see how many hours of editing you have. So like one of the presentation I was doing right then had over 700 editing hours just on that block. And I, I've had uncountable blocks over the years. I kind of laughed and I thought like, wow, like <laughs> I guess this, this has to work for the hours input at this point. You know? We had, dude, I mean, I have thousands of hours in my program, thousands. That's what I'm saying. That's just one block. And it was like 780 hours or something. I was like, that's just this, you know, I'll crazy. You we had a guy who, uh, you know, I'm not talking shit about the fellow. But he came and did a class, tried it out, and it didn't work out. During his class program, I was given critiques, and I said, you got to tear this whole thing down. It's, it's, it's just, it's not good. You know, I, I told you to make all these adjustments. Nothing, nothing, it was, it's, you got, you got so much more work to do. This is, like, not even close to ready. And he said, uh, well, dude, I have, like, five to six hours into it. And I was, like, almost spit my water out. So I, Rob Ferrero happened to be there. I go, hey, Rob, this guy says he's got uh, – Five to six hours to his program. You've been teaching here for about a year now. How many hours has he got in your program? He goes, I don't know, 700 to 1,000. So Rob's got 700 to 1,000. He's been here for a little less than a year. Right. He's got five to six hours. Right. You know, so the, the, the quality, just unfortunately, we cannot move forward with the program sure. for many reasons, but that was certainly one factor to consider. But anyway. I remember that when I actually, when I, so the first time we met was actually, uh, well, not the first time we met, I take that back. One of the first times we met after talking about, uh, you, me coming on with you guys and um, you had put together a zoom meeting and you said, Hey, all at the time, I think you were in a real development time too. I think you'd gone from like X amount of instructors to like X times three anyway. And so you put a lot of us on a zoom and you said, Hey, you know, let's talk. It was actually funny as you'd even said, you go, all right, look, I said, you were like, I'm going to start this real simple. I'm going to give you an example. Here's what I don't want to see. And you, you were the word drugs, like in live time, you had like the uh, PowerPoint, like you made up on the spot, <laughs> you wrote like drugs and you go, I don't want to see drugs and then a bunch of bullets about thoughts on drugs. You're like, at a minimum, you're like, put something on there. And you, you literally just Googled drugs and picture of some lady like sticking heroin around. You put the picture up there. You're like, okay, at a minimum, that has to be there. You were like, and then he's like, these are your talking points, not your reading points. It was good. I, I knew then I was like, all right. I was like, this is good because I'm the same way. I put together a couple where I haven't done it in a while, honestly, because again, I, I'm not just saying this. Every training is really different. I mean, I have so much material I've gone through over the years. I'll, I'll, I kind of like Lego block it, you know, for the, for the, for the presentation. If I'm going to a college campus or something like, like even like locally here for mostly like campus cops, like I don't even get into motor vehicle stuff and all that. So I can, whatever I can piece together. But um, I remember I was, I was putting together one, one time and, uh, and, it, and it had to do with, I wanted to be interesting. And when I tell you, I spent no exaggeration, no exaggeration. Just the first night, probably three or four hours, 
on one slide, right? And I'll explain why in a second, because I know you're already thinking this is one of those you know, things that someone tries to make a point and exaggerates. But no, it was three or four hours on one slide. And then over probably the next like three weeks, probably another couple of hours tweaking. But anyway, what it was is I wanted to make, you know, South Park? Oh, yeah. I right, see so, you know, Terrence and Philip, they're like the cartoon within the cartoon, yeah. like characters, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, the, the Canadian, like, you know, a little, you know, hey, bud. Uh-huh. So anyway, I literally wanted to make characters. So I literally made characters like bad guys. I cut their heads in half. So when they talk, I could click the button. So the thing was like 1,100 slides for what was really only going to be about a three-minute joke, right? Wow. But hey, bud. And while they were talking, so as I'm going through the story, I had a car come by. So it's just a story I'm telling, but to try to make it more dynamic. And I started thinking this would be funny. But I just ended up in the rabbit hole. And I got three or four hours later, I ended up with what's essentially three minutes of a class. But just these things, it was, <laughs> it was epic. But to speak to the level of attention and how much I want it to be entertaining, I guess maybe it's a good example. Well, I think um, anything you do, the devil's in the details. And, you know, man, I think every instructor at this company, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you think the same way, like literally as I'm teaching, I like step out of my body and I'm like, okay. I can fix this or I know exactly how to change. I'm I'm writing notes. I'll tell people like, look guys, I know there's 200 people here watching me talk. I'm not messaging on my phone. I've said that. I've said that. Yeah. I've I've said that to them. I've even said it a couple of times. I've already done it once or twice. And then like at some other point, I'll even say, go just so you guys know, I'm not texting. I'm like, this is where my new ideas come from, you know, live time. When I, uh, when I do presentations at like a police Academy or something, you can make the recruits do anything. So I've had a running joke for years where I'll just joke and be like, hey, listen, you know, Santa's Santa gets all the credit and stuff. I'm like, you know, it's the elves who do the work. And I, I'll like make a joke about it. So then as the day goes on, I'll assign different recruits and elf jobs. So like if I need someone to hit the lights, I'm like, hey, I'm like, uh, who's there the lights? Well, it's me. So you're a light elf. And then every so often I'm like, light elf. And he'll hit the lights and stuff. <laughs> I got like, you know, I the, I the different elves. And it stemmed back to a, a guy who, who, Dodd the Academy uh, years ago, uh, even before I was in. And he used to joke and do a quiz elf thing. And I always got a kick out of it. It was clever. So I've expanded into like, I was doing a class one day, someone sneezed. Three minutes later, they sneezed again. So at one point, I, I had to make him the God bless you elf. And then he had to correct other, you know, he had to God bless you if other people sneezed. But anyway, the moral of the story is I always have a note taker elf. And, um, and with that, I'll have an idea and I'll know what it means. It'll mean nothing to them, but I'll say things like, um, you know, something about Mary meme on slide 36. And they don't know what it means, but I just, and I'm not even going to use something about Mary meme, but I, that story is what reminded me of, oh, I'm going to tell a story about this. You know, I'm going to add a piece about this. I do. I mean, I, if you saw the notes that I write, people have no idea what they would mean. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. the man, it's like the Manson diary, you know? You know, it's, um, it's interesting how once I had a guy write to me today, literally messages that I received this morning. He goes, just, just took your proactive control tactics class. And day one after the class, I was able to put it to use. This, he took it online, took it over the weekend online. Well, it wasn't drugs or guns or anything crazy. I still think there were drugs in the car, but she gave consent. Da, 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 da. I was able to see that something wasn't right. And based off questioning and some good computer use, I was able to find two occupants of the vehicle had uh, no contact order and were in violation. I say congrats. He goes, no, thank you. 90% of what was talked about in your class in the interdiction class was either never taught in the academy or just glossed over. I said, I'm aware. He said, and after seeing it, you're like, well, duh, this should be taught instead of trial and error learning on the streets. But I think that's really what happens is I think once you understand what you're looking for and how to problem solve and or figure things out, that's what right. the whole game is, is, 100%. you know. Well, also, a lot of what we talk about, and when I say we are the communicative me, you, everyone at Street Cop, and I'm, I'm sure other, other, other platforms, you know, police academies, whatever. Anybody who's really kind of putting their back in with, there's a few sort of basic principles we accept, right? And and sometimes just in life, it's sometimes just putting a word to it brings it out in clarity. So like, like I'll, I'll say to people sometimes like, um, you know, hey, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to be common sense. And people are like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm really good at common sense. It's like, you can't be good at common sense. It's not a thing. It's a false credit we give ourselves. You know, you hear these quotes, you know, uh, I, I, I get I'm not, I'm not book smart, but you know, I, I got a PhD in common sense. It's like, okay, well, what you just said was you have a PhD in just things already worked out because that's what common sense is. It, it's not, it's not a way of thinking really. I think it gets mislabeled. It's something that already worked out well. Like I've used the example before. I said, I walk into a brand new training facility, right? New room I've never presented in. And I go to set the computer up and you, you know, this feeling better than anybody. Sometimes you get there, it's plug and it's on the screen and the sound. 
Other times you get there and there's four buttons here and a guy named, you know, you know, Philip was got the, he's got the, he's not in till nine, but he'll be able to get the audio going for you. And you have, you put this together. So as you're sorting that, like imagine the moment where you got stuck and you went, I, I can't figure this out. And then somebody else from that training venue said, I'll take care of it. And they get up and fixed it for you. When they sat back down, if the person next to them said, how'd you get it working? They would describe it as common sense. They go, well, it's common sense. I plug the HDMI in and I hit the power button and then I move the slide over. It's common sense because they, it already worked. They wouldn't say, oh, uh, Dennis, let me help you with that. This is going to be common sense. You wouldn't call it common sense before you do it. So what I'm basically saying is common sense is a hindsight. It already went well. And looking back on it, you're like, oh, yeah, that made sense. So I think with a lot of our presentations, what we end up doing is we bring things to light that really are just common sense. You've put a tag on it, put a name to it. You've, you've said, hey, you know this thing? Like, uh, I'll give you an example. You know, you, I'll, I'll say sometimes to people, how many of you guys have had, you know, lawful purpose and all this to, to be searching the individuals in a car? And you do an exit order and you get an individual out of this car. And just before you go to search him, he says to you, you know, hey, uh, listen, search me. I don't care. He then reaches in and bunny ears his own pockets for you. Just pulls his pockets right out for you and then kicks his shoes off. You search whatever you need. And like, and I always laugh at that. And I go like, just think about that for a minute. I'm like, where are the drugs not going to be? You know, probably not in the shoe he offered up. Probably not in the, in the, in the, the pockets he bunny it. Now, am I saying there's somewhere else? Not guaranteed. But again, if he has something on him, it will not be what he's offering. But what it is, it's his mind saying, look how cooperative I am. So that way, you know, you go to check, you don't find something right away. And you think, well, this guy's obviously got nothing to hide. He's, He's off. He took his shoes off, for Christ's sake. But then I say, like, step back and look, put that in context and think for a second. When's the last time, like, you, you came across a law enforcement officer? Even the y'all, prior to being a cop. Just, I mean, I was a young kid, you know. I you met some cop. He's like, hey, guys, he's talking for whatever reason. You felt that he'd take your shoes off. It's such an over-the-top action that once you kind of point it out to people, they go, yeah, it's actually really weird and has very little explanation. But then you call back, say, he wants your attention here. Look here. Does that mean something in the car? Yeah, sometimes it does. Does that mean something in another pocket? Sometimes it does. Does it mean it's got his, he's got a buddy who's got a warrant? He's just putting on the show. Keep your attention here on me. You know, don't, don't ask him his name. Look how cooperative I am. So now when he gives you the name Joe Smith and you run it and you go, what's your social? And he goes, I don't know it. Oh, I, I don't have any history of you. I've never been arrested. Yeah, you, you don't even get a driver's license either. I never got a license. You're 32. You know what I mean? You never got a license. What do you do for work? Uh, construction. <laughs> you know, it's the yeah. same but predictable answers. They say, like, you know, when you walk into these things, so once you kind of say it out loud, people go, yeah, 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 that pattern now reads. So now when they walk into that moment, it, it's, it, it's, it's shinier, you know, it's, it, it stands out more. Yeah, I mean, you're you're literally setting triggers for people to be aware. It's just a perspective of triggers is a good word. What it looks like. This is what it looks like. This is. I actually have a lot of big ideas based off of that premise alone. I think that's the best way to train. Is this what it looks like? And when you see it, you'll know exactly what it is. It'll click in your head and go, "I know it is." And you'll watch people. I mean, think about this. When you're new, how much time do you spend trying to figure out who somebody is? Right, you're out there you can compel identification. The guy or girl is giving you false information. You'll sit there and play games with them for 10, 12, 15 minutes. One, maybe because you don't know legally what you can do. Two, you don't know. You're unsure if they're actually telling the truth or not. Three, you know, just the list goes on and on. But then you get shown what it looks like when here's seven people when they were lying about who they are. Now you're out there and in 15 seconds, you're like, put this guy in cuffs. I mean, we, we are ready. This, you know, uh, what's your name? Spell it. Uh, Michael. M I C K H A. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start it again. Oh, yeah. No, put this motherfucker in cuffs. Right. Right. Uh, right. Until we figure out who he is, at least at a very minimum. I'm not saying that uh, for the context of the podcast to immediately make a pro- an arrest on probable cause, but I, w- I would practically articulate that you're probably pretty close to probable cause at that point. Well, the point uh, is, is that if, if probable cause is, if, if it's a scale, when you're putting pebbles into weigh the scale, the point isn't so much that one thing gives you probable cause another, but to, to your point, it's 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 a pebble on this side that says, okay, you know, you're, you're doing an investigation, and the investigation is is starting to to tip that there, there might be something wrong here. You know, like a lot of what we talk about isn't even crime; it's deception. You know, what what that deception is of? I mean, who can say? I think the last time we spoke, and I was telling you, I said, you know, the term I use is, you know, I say arrow logic. You know, 
And I say, like the, the, the example I gave last time, if no one heard that one, I said, you know, if I, if I'm a multimillionaire, there's, there's no way of knowing how I got those millions. You know, like it doesn't mean I necessarily won it on a scratch ticket, but if I win $10 million on a scratch ticket, I am a multimillionaire. And I say, and that's like what we do with the, with the presentations we do. I say, just because I, or someone else shows you videos or tells examples of this is what it looks like when someone does something wrong. That doesn't mean when you see that, that that person's doing something wrong. It does not mean that. Just like being a millionaire doesn't mean you want to scratch ticket. However, if there is something wrong, you will definitely see these indicators. The same way, if someone wins a $10 million scratch ticket, they are definitely a monthly millionaire. So it's arrow logic. A does equal B, but B does not equal A, you know? And so like with that, um, you know, it's, and I don't just say that as a disclaimer, but it is a disclaimer, which is, you know, we might, I may play you, you know, 10 videos that I, I put together for a presentation showing this one action and you leave there going, got it. And then you go out and then you see that one action and then you open up and it turns out exactly what you thought would be there is going to be there. Whatever evidence you thought that was going to lead to. That doesn't mean the next time you see that, that evidence is going to be there because you might just meet someone else with a different personality. You know, all we're saying is that when there's something there, people can't cover it. You know, like everything from the, you know, I know like you do the stuff, you know, everything from the felony stretch and all these different things. Hey guy, people are also just going to stretch, you know, like I, I, I go to the presentations. I think even in yours, people say things like, um, you know, hey, a guy suddenly asked to have a cigarette, you know, it means he's nervous. It's his last cigarette before jail. Again, arrow logical to suggest when someone smokes and there's something wrong, they're going to definitely do it at that exact time. But let's not ignore the fact that the guy who smokes cigarettes being held up by the cop is going to have a few minutes of boredom. Probably a good time for a cigarette, right? So yeah. it's not, it's not one doesn't, you know, A equals B, but B does not equal A. And so, um, what was one of the ones someone said to me, uh, kind of recently? What was it? Oh, uh, when people, uh, ask to get their, take their wall when they get out of the car. And they say, Yeah, guy, say, hey, sir, I step out of the car. And then the guy says, Okay, well, let me just grab my wallet. And they're like, He knows he's going to jail again, possibly. Our logical suggests that if he knows he's going to jail, he's going to want to get the wallet. But the other part of that is, I'm thinking just Tommy. Some cops ask me to get out of a car. I don't know this dude. You know, I might read the papers and think a little iffy about cops. You know, with what I've seen in the last five years. Yeah, I'm not leaving you alone my wallet. It's my money. It's my license. It's, a, it's got my, my uh, medical card to my kids. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's coming with me. I'm coming out of the car. I'm just going to grab my wallet, you know? So, again, one A equals B, but B does not always equal A. And I, we really try to drive that point home because we're not trying to create stormtroopers out here. You know better than anybody. You know, we want well, cops who are thinking, taking notes, collecting those pebbles on the scale. If you, if you as an officer are able to get to that point yourself, for whether it's RAS or whether it's PC, um, that's your job. You know, what we're trying to provide to you is no, is no, no shortcut to that. We're just, when you get to the point that you got there, we want you to have more intelligent commentary on it. You know, we want you to sit there and say, yeah, I didn't, I'm not going to write a report. I felt like something was wrong. Like that, that's 1984 week game right there. You know, like we want these detailed breakdowns of all these things you noticed. So when you were able to legally get there, that's your job. But honing you in to all these details you otherwise might not have even recognized, you know. And there's so many great videos like for that. Like this is someone sent me one uh, recently. It was a, I think it's probably a TikTok or something. But it was like uh, it's a woman who's just obviously you know it's a TikTok and she was chosen for this reason. But she's just gorgeous, right? And she's just her figure and all this. But she's picking up a crying baby and she's shaking the baby like from behind. So it's like the, it's filming like a like a baby cam. And she's behind the baby, so her whole body's going up and down, filming her from the back. And then basically it cuts to like a split screen. A guy goes, what color was the baby's shirt? And he keeps saying, he goes, what color was the baby's shirt? What color was the baby? But it's funny because then when you look back on it, this woman's in clearly just like all white, very basic. And this baby's in this flaming red, over the top, you know, things hanging off it, man, like the tassels. And stuff. It is foolishly over the top. You shouldn't have missed that in a hundred years. You know what I mean? But it is funny because you take that second to go, yeah, hashtag tunnel vision, I guess. When I see police videos, you know, especially, and I hate to bring it up, about officer-involved shootings, uh, and even worse, the ones where police officers are subject to being injured or losing their lives, you know, us as instructors with experience in this field, and I'm not, believe me, I don't think I'm the best by any stretch of the imagination. I am just doing what I have or working with what I have to work with to try to make things better. I'm, I'm not the end-all and be-all of all police knowledge and Believe me, if I was still on the street, I think I'd probably still be making a ton of mistakes. But sure. we watch these videos and I just go, I mean, how did he not 
see this coming, you know, like how, you know, so for us, for me, at least, and I know I can speak on probably behalf of most of the instructors here, we want you to know what we're seeing. We want you to know what we know. That's the whole game of this program is we know we know a lot more than most people do. And we're not trying to take it to the grave with us. We want to leave it with you for the 20 plus years that we've all had inexperience in this field here. This right. is for you. I made this for you. I could have chosen not to make it for you, but I made it for you because I think it may save your life. So how often do you find yourself watching those videos and you're like, Jesus. It was wild is like for a lot of the, the things, I mean, and it also goes back to, you know, um, I mean, because so first of all, so I, I, I'm not, I'm not in the field that some of the guys get into. Like I know like a lot of instructors are street cop, they get in like officer safety and uh, these were tactics and, you know, patrol tactics and things like that. I'm in a different realm. So I, a lot of what I'm doing is, um, it's actually not tactics based. I, I, I make no such claims. In fact, I often stop at the point of contact, like, you know, like, so like I'll, I'll give examples. And again, I got to I bring a lot of receipts. Like, you know, I, I have a lot of videos that I show, but you know, just simple things, you know, that like, <laughs> I'm going to lie about his name, you know, and, and his name is Dennis. And he's right here. And I'm going to make up the name, Michael, my brain is going to make an association. I'm going to think of a Michael I know in real life. So when you say, you know, how long you known him? I'm like, oh, I, I, I've known him. And he'll point away because his brain can't point at him and say, Michael, you know, I've known Michael for a while. Like in the, these subtle little things. So they're, they're fun. They're clever. Right. But like, what's the odds of catching him in real time? Right. Not, not always perfect. But what's funny is when you when you have enough of these kind of tools in the tool basket, sometimes you can slow it down. For that. You actually can. You can almost you can trigger it. You can actually create it. You actually ask the question for the sole purpose of seeing can I elicit the activation of this response, right? And that's when it gets real interesting. So what I love, um, I get a lot of texts as well. And when I say a lot, um, I, I'm not going to go as so far as I say daily, but over the course of a week, enough that I could have been daily. Like I might get like two in one day and then not one for two days, whatever. But um, pretty close to about five a week consistently where people send me the little, you know, hey, I had the class and they give me the breakdown of what happened. And so what I find great about it is when they sit there and even say that, they go like, I knew, I knew that I was possibly looking at this. So I specifically did this. And then when he did this, you know, it made me look here, you know? And um, so like, I'll give you an example like this. So there was a, one guy sends me a text and he basically is telling the story. And in the story, he's saying like, they're dealing with this one kid for a warrant. And he, he referred back to a thing that I did. And in my class, I had this kind of joke about, from the folks who brought you the fake phone call, they now bring you, and then I have something else, like a fake behavior, right? The fake phone calls, the Coca-Cola of them all, like cops, I go, like, oh, geez, uh, yeah, I was always on the phone. It, it gives me an excuse to settle nervous energy. I can I can move and I don't look weird now and expel all that you know electricity in my body. It gave me an excuse to ignore you, change direction. Oh, phone call. Oh my God, I have to go this way. So, but I say like, from the folks that brought you the fake phone call, we now bring you, and there's all these other ones we kind of do, like little like joke the chapters that pop up every so often. And one of them is the fake store visit, you know, I'm talking about the, the dudes who hang out outside the store. And every time a cop drives by, they just choose that moment. Oh, I, I have to go inside the store, you know. And then if the cop pays no attention, he comes back out. So I'll do like a Q&A with the room and I'll say, all right, there's no reason to train this. It's common sense. I said, so I'm going to have you guys train it to me right now. You're the bad guy. You have a gun in your waistband. Cop just drove by the store. What are you going to do? And someone in the room will shout out, you know, go in the store. Great. What part of the store do you go to? And that's it. They'll stop thinking for a second. Now they're, now they're kind of in the game. They'll go, someone will go, back of the store. And I'll go, not yet. Why? And someone else will know it. They'll go, because you're going to see if the cop is even paying attention, which is driving by. 100%. You're going to go hide in the back of the store just as a cop drove by. You're going to be in the front of the store. Where near the front of the store? Someone will yell out, by the window. Doing what? Watching the cop. If the cop keeps driving, what are you going to do? Wait a second to come out. Exactly. Cop comes back again. Where are you going to go? In the store. Where? By the front window. And then what happens when the cop pulls over? Where are you going to go? They go back of the store. Create that distance. What part of the back of the store? And that's it. Someone will usually get it. Someone will say, somewhere where I can still see if the cop came in. I'm going to still be able to see the door. So that's it. I say, all right, now you see someone comes in. What do you do? They say, hide the gun behind a can of beans or into a bag of chips or something, right? What do you do next? And someone in the room will say it. They'll go, create distance from the gun. And that's when I'll point out, say, now think about this. I want to be able to see the cop, but I don't want to leave this gun. I mean, this is still expensive to me, you know? 
So I'm going to be somewhere in a line of sight where, where I create distance. It's usually going to be an absolute straight line. Wherever the gun is will be a straight line to where they go. And then what will I do now? And the class always gets it. They go, because it's a joke that I've already made a bunch of times. They go, look busy. Because that's the whole thing is look busy, you know? That's it. And so we'll talk about that. So I see you come in there and you see some guy and all of a sudden, like I've given examples. Like I, I got one where a guy, you know, the French breads, they're like in a cartoon when they buy groceries, there's always long French breads that no one actually really usually generally buys in real life, but they're always yeah. like in a grocery bag. But they had fr- hanging French breads. That's exactly what the kid did. He went, he went to the French bread, he started sorting French bread. Is if while standing on the street, you know, corner with four of my friends, while active gang problems going on with us lately, I suddenly went, oh, my God, a cop. That's right, too. I need French bread. And then when he goes in there, like, <laughs> I must select the appropriate French bread for the plan that I swear I already had, you know, and like, but yeah, maybe sorting the French bread. But then it's a game of like, find the gun now. So draw a straight line, stand at the French bread and just look at it like this. Look at the furthest you could go from there, you know, a straight line, point to point, wall that spot out. So usually corners, you know. And at that corner, look, you find a gun there. And like I said, now and you've never held this guy up. This isn't a safety issue. This isn't, a, this isn't contact here. There's no, there's no tactics here. The fact that this kid leaves a store, you know him, it's great. Make, make him up of it. Have a nice day. <laughs> Say hi, you know. Then you find that gun, you pull in surveillance, you know, now you have your cases. So we talk a lot about making cases and walking, making cases and getting warrants. And But again, that's some parts of the presentation we do when we talk about knowing your community, knowing who your bad guys are. Uh, a lot of that falls into the city stuff. But, the, um, but then when we talk about the general behaviors of the general public, it's the same stuff. It's that I can, I can do things to cause certain behaviors that don't mean there's something wrong. But if there's something wrong, you will have that behavior. You, know? you reminded me of a gas station stories of my friend. We were working uh, in an unmarked car. I, I didn't prefer unmarked cars. But it was the car that was assigned when I came in that night. And I was like, why did you give me the unmarked car? <laughs> the response was, we like to do work. We figure we give them our car. I go, yeah, the kind of work I need to do creates uh, a reaction to this very, very marked unit, but it is what it is. And secondly, if there's a pursuit, I'm not relinquishing the front because I, I, I want to have a, in the future, LT, marked car, your boy here. Well, I, you know, I, not, I know what you meant by it. I, I know that it was like a reward thing. I don't want a marked car. I want a marked car. Um, I'm over the allure in year nine of driving a Mark car. The first time I drove one, I thought I was this shit. Believe me. Oh, yeah. Cops and cargo shorts. Yeah, that's the goal, right? But dude, big day when you get to drive like an unmarked slick top or uh, something that just looks different than what everybody else drives. A very big day for the cops. Sure. But anyway, so I'm at a gas station. And it's like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. It's a little bit of a slow night. And I'm trolling around. So I come through the gas station. We have two 24-hour gas stations. This one I particularly like because or actually I'm more protective of because if they hit this gas station where our crime goes back to up north, this is the gas station they're going to hit because they don't got to make a U-turn. They can go in, hit it, stab the guy, grab the shit, and be gone. And by the time we get there, they're already back home where they belong. Uh, so I drive through this gas station, and I'll never forget seeing a man and woman inside the through the window of the gas station. And I said, uh, and when they looked up, they seemed pretty surprised to see me and looked down very quickly. The guy was with said, uh, I go, oh, we got we got some good ones here. He goes, what do you mean? I go, this is why you got to be observant, brother. Three head on a swivel, 360, knowing your environment. I drive past this gas station every night, right? Sometimes people are in there. Usually it's a truck driver goes in, gets something, leaves, comes out. You got two people hanging out at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning in a gas station convenience store. That is- And not to stop you there, but but the important part is when you said there, drive by here every night, you know the baseline. You know what normal looks like here. Right. You know what normal baseline. So now you can flag out, out, outside of baseline. Go ahead. So I said, look, there's no cars in a parking lot. I don't think they're, they, they took a car to get here. So they're on foot. So what I'm going to do, I tell them what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, so I'm going to come back around the corner. I'll give it another minute. And it's funny you say this because what were they doing? They were at the window, right by the window, uh, actually the back of like the, the soda machine or maybe the, the cafe espresso machine faced up against the glass. Well, they were next to it reading magazines now at 2.30 in the morning. So now they're, they're looking at the magazines. And as I come through again, they, I can see the one just kind of like looking up to see what we're doing. Gives me like the look up like this. And then as we pulled back, I go, I'm going to pull as far away from their view as I can. I'm going to see if they lean into the glass, see where I'm going. And I'm looking in the rear view. I just see them like leaning over, looking to see where I went. I go, all right, yeah, this is it. They're going to, something's going on here. We'll figure it out. I go, at very minimum, I got a funny feeling these people are going to be wanted by the law. So he said, well, what are we going to do? I said, look, there's only one street. They're not running across the highway. It's a medial barrier. It's a dangerous highway. There's nowhere to go. They would have come to this gas station. Here, there's another one across the street. Like I said, 
they would have went to that one if it was closer to them. They wouldn't have ran across the highway and it's a three lane highway each side, medial barrier. And at that time, we had a fence up too. It's just, they're coming back out this way. So there's a, there's a street here. He goes, well, what are we going to do? I go, well, listen, at very minimum, I'm going to walk up, stick my hand out and say hello. Right. And he goes, he goes, well, what else do you got? I go, the other thing is there's a sidewalk here and there's a street. If they're walking down the street, that's a violation of motor vehicle code. Um, and I'll start with a consensual count, uh, encounter and we'll, we'll have to, if we have to use the motor vehicle code for walking in a street, with a sidewalk present, that's what we'll use. And I'm not going to harass them. I just need to figure out who these people are and what they're up to. So we go around now the unmarked car. So I go and like hide it between two cars, turn it off. You know, we were hanging out for a while. He goes, you think they're going to come? I go, brother, they're going to come. I'm telling you, we're, we're, we're here till 6 a.m. They are just trying to play it as cool as possible. They want us to get another service call. Put your mind, put your brain into where they're at. This guy's going to leave. He's going to go do something else. He's going to get bored. Hopefully they get a call for service. Maybe, maybe 15 minutes later, here they come walking right down the center of the street. I can never, I don't forget seeing it like with the, the spotlight of the, the, you know, of the street light. Yeah, they come right through the thing. So I said, there you go. So I come out, uh, they probably had a small plastic bag of like candy and shit. And I said, hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Uh, my name is uh, Alex Brino. Nice to meet you guys. And he's like, yeah, what's up? I'm like, hey, do uh, you guys have any idea on you at all? And he's like, for what? I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, well, in the state of New Jersey, you actually have to employ the sidewalk when there's a sidewalk present. You're driving, you're walking down the middle of the street at night. There's a significant danger factor for this kind of street. People come down this road all the time. And for you guys, especially, it's a, it's a, you know, I don't want you to get hit by a car. And so ended up being, they had, um, they had robbery warrants. So that's, I mean, really, it was, a, it was a nice piece because we saw it and then we used the law to achieve a larger law enforcement objective was, Although people might think that this is a uh, simple, you know, like, oh, you're, you're using this vague law. Like, why, first of all, why do you think they gave it to us in the law? But two, here's the good news. If they were not doing anything wrong and had no warrants, it would have been, hey, guys, uh, good deal. Listen, I'm not going to give you guys any summons. It's just in the future. Know that at night, we're concerned for your safety. You got to stay in use sidewalks. That's all. No ticket. It's usually a $54 fine. Here's your license back. Have a good night. Be safe. Take care. But I used it in a different way of how many more robberies were they going to do, right. right? It was a guy and girl team. Uh, county, had a, county had a Nobel warrant for them. They wanted them. These were wanted people hiding out. I'd have had this so many times where a guy, I'll tell you, almost the same exact block. I'm driving down uh, southbound on this highway. Guy walks out of his, out of his hotel room door. So I'd say motel. It's a motel room door. Walks out, takes about seven steps. Sees the police car coming on the highway, do about 45 miles an hour, turns around, goes back into the hotel. Got something in the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden. So I take the car. I just call it out right away. I go, you have, my badge number is 511. I'll go 511. I'll be on foot. Put me up 511 mobile. Dude, I, I parked the car around the back of the building where I know, he, I know the area. He can't see the police car. I get out of the car, make sure my keys aren't jingling like an asshole, stuff them in my pockets, make no noise. I sit in the corner and then I, here he comes. A minute later, door opens again. I know where he's going. Actually, that same convenience store to go buy cigarettes. He starts walking, and I just walk straight in front of his hotel room door. No matter what, he's going to have to, if he's going to retreat, he's going to have to try to get through me. So psychologically, I've created that barrier. He does not want to contact me. I guess my, I might have made a little bit of a noise. He turns around and looks and sees me, and uh, he starts to walk a little further. I go, my man, my man, yo, let me get you for a second. Real quick, got to ask you a question. He's like, what's, he's like, uh, yeah, what's up? And I'm like, hey, man, um, you have any idea on you at all? And he's like, for what? I'm like, for that warrant you got. He's like, how do you know I got a warrant? I'm like, now I know you got a warrant. <laughs> right? So I go, let me guess. You're going to go buy. He's like, yeah, I got a fucking warrant, dude. I'm like, oh, cool. You're under arrest. He goes, you how'd you know? And I gave it to him. I said, bro, I drove down the highway. The, the second you saw me, you turned back around back to that thing. He goes, well, how'd you have a warrant? I go, well, that was just a guess. I go, let me guess this. You were going over there to get cigarettes? He goes, how'd you know that? I go, because everybody who fucking hangs out at this piece of shit motel goes to that gas station for cigarettes. And they're hiding out, man. I've had people who were, on the run, fugitive from justice all over the country at that same motel. So you, to me, you know, some people don't like playing the game of running names and running socials and all that stuff. But I've got people who have, you know, nationwide extradition warrants and wanted for some real heinous shit. And to me, that's still a good arrest where I can clean uh, some fish real quick and get back on the road and put some more work in. It, it, honestly, today's day and age, it's, it's, it's interesting. So we, we we talk a lot in the presentations I do 
<clears throat> about deciding when to walk away. I mean, because the, the truth is, is, you know, you and I can have a conversation about an encounter like that, you know, and say, yeah, I, I knew it. I knew it. You confidently just say these things to the guy. What's funny is, like, you know, today's day and age, um, you know, you, you go up to some guy who doesn't have a warrant. You say something like, you know, hey, what's the warrant for? So, I mean, you know, nowadays, you know, that's that's uh, that's that's looked at, you know, in, in, a, in a much uh, maybe even more appropriate light about, you know, how how we're thinking of things. So one of the things we do talk about, I did think it was funny that you said you walked up and said, no, how you doing? You know, and that's actually one of the taglines you know, we, we talk about. I said, listen, and that's as far as, you know, we, we really take it in the presentations. But the, the importance of just say hello and then just see where the book writes itself. Sometimes you'll walk up and say hello to a guy, you know, hey, how you doing? You know, how's everything going on? And then you end up meeting a community member. It's fantastic. You know, yeah, guy says, yeah, I actually live. I live right back here. I'm out here because I got a, I got a, I got a nine year old son hangs out with his buddy. I just want to make sure he's not out here doing things stupid. Hey, how you doing? You know, here's my name. Great to meet you. You live here. It's, it's outstanding. You know, come to another one You just say hello. And you know, it's, and it goes another way. You know, Hey, yeah, no, I'm, I'm here because of this reason. Great. Oh, that's awesome. You know, and I'm here for this is my purpose is the police and great interaction. Great. And then you go to say hi to someone else and just say hello and everything falls apart. And then you stop <laughs> playing a little hot and cold game and all the other stuff. But like I said, in, in the book, sort of writes itself, you know, but, um, but we do talk a lot about how, you know, relying on your spidey senses. It's a, it's a dangerous game these days. You know, cops like, ah, I didn't have anything, but I knew something was wrong. My answer to that was walk away, man, walk away. You could be having so many more positive interactions uh, and putting your time into that and dealing with one that goes sour that you later cannot defend just because you want to explain to someone your spidey senses, you know? And I think that's what people also try to rely too much on the, on, on presentations and trainings for the same thing where they go, Oh yeah, I knew it because of this. I say, well, no, we, we told you from the beginning, that's not a thing. You know, you can't know anything based on the presentation. We're just giving you indicators that when you have it, you're intelligently documenting. You're not missing it. You know, you don't just say, hey, I ran into this and I saw this one thing. So I acted. We're going to help you get in a position. You say, I got in here and I saw five things that all were common sense to me because I'm now aware of it. You know, one of the examples I could use is, you know, if I say to a, a cop on patrol, um, you know, hey, there's a, there's a bolo right now for a car. It's a, a maroon Hummer, you know, you think a maroon Hummer, that's going to be unique, you know, and that's it. Suddenly you, you, you look around, you find a maroon Hummer, you're like, it's got to be it. What's funny is there's a, uh, there's a frequency illusion that takes place. And once I said maroon Hummer, you're going to be synced now and highlighted for a maroon Hummer. The reality is you, in that night, you'll see five maroon Hummers that night, guaranteed. And none of them might even be the suspect. But the fact is, is once we key you to the idea of a maroon Hama, you're not going to miss it because you focused on it. And that's what it is for all the trainings. We're talking about things, not because they can always mean something, you know, just because you see a maroon Hama doesn't mean it's the guy that's wanted from the bolo they put out earlier. But the fact is, you're going to see every maroon Hama that passes you now because you've been keyed to it. You, a maroon Hama won't pass you unnoticed. Versus like, you know, when we talk about these training cues and different things that happen, whether it be behaviors or actions or statements, they would have just gone right by you because they weren't keyed. You know, they weren't they weren't synced to your brain yet. But once someone's talked about it, you went to you know Brad's class, he talks about it. You go to Dennis's class, talks about it. And Kenny's class, he talks about it. You go to my class, talk about it. Now this repetition thing says, okay, this is no longer common sense. This is now a hindsight. This is now something that when I see it, I actually know it like it's part of my hand. And then now you can start to read these things and like a maroon humma, you're not going to miss it. Well, you're less likely to miss it, I should say. You know, there's a few things that I wanted to point out. Um, it's another factor I want to iterate the importance of knowing case law and knowing what a consensual contact is and knowing what action you can take still considered legitimate with or without reasonable suspicion by the court system. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go out and try to be proactive, number one, you need administrative cover and administrative support. There's no question about it because um, recently over the weekend, I talked to a gentleman whose administration had a target on his back and he was still being proactive. And He's in a tough spot right now, that is for sure. I'll leave it at that vague. And I know that he called me and I generally am unavailable unless it is that detrimental for me to get involved to try to help you, especially yeah. when you've been done dirty. I will jump in and I said to him, I know what you want me to say. I know what you want to hear. But the fact of the matter is they got you. Yeah. Do I think what they're doing to you is correct? No. I said, this is the, and I'm not trying to take an opportunity because it's not going to make you feel any better for me to say, this is the importance of knowing case law. But this is the importance of knowing case law. You're going out and trying to do the right thing, not trying to be malicious. And there was some issues with the Fourth Amendment. And it just was a matter of the way you did it. You could have taken better steps to achieve your goal, but you're not reading it. And it's how, I said, how long are you on a job? Because four or five years, whatever he said. I said, yeah. 
you know, you haven't picked up a book once and you're out trying to be proactive. You've got to know comfortably how am I maneuvering out here? So when I say I'll start with consensual contact and I'll have that violation to back me up, I know what a consensual contact is. Now, stemming off of that, there's a book by a guy named Rich Voss. I uh, know Rich Voss. Uh, what's his name? Chris Voss. Rich Voss is a comedian. I read it. Uh, I never split the difference. I read it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as, if, as if you like to. Yeah, bogging like as if your life depends on it. It's called. How about how about the handshake part? Did you read that part about shaking somebody's hand, introducing yourself by your first name? Yeah, hundred percent true. Powerful too powerful thing. Yeah, and and he was also talking about how the failure to introduce someone else. It's interesting, you know. Like if I if I don't care about you, you know what I mean. I don't give you titles and stuff like that. You know, it's interesting. In fact, uh, Janine Driver brings that up in her uh, you, know, "You Can't Lie to Me" course. If I'm standing next to you, and I say, you know, hey, this is Dennis, my boss. There's a guaranteed moment there where I've given you title, so there's a natural thing. But if I go, yeah, and uh, and this is uh, this is this is Dennis, unless there's a comfortability there, then that's actually a strange thing to do. The example that they give uh, in the classes, they talk about like you know you have a guy and he's standing there with his wife, and it's him and his wife. He knows that her title is the wife, and so they meet two people and they say, hey, what's going on? You know, who's this? Hey, oh, this is you know let's let's say she's using a name. We say Aaron. You know, oh, this is Aaron. You know she's been demoted to Aaron, you know, instead of, you know, hi, this is my wife, Aaron, you know what I mean? And say that those things are interesting. So it's like, it is funny that there, there are this, this cues in the words to the point of introducing yourself, saying the name. My favorite part of the whole thing was how the negotiations always needed a weird number. Mm -hmm. saying because the brain then says, well, if he's saying all they can come up with is seven thousand three hundred and fifty dollars. And he change in there too. And 26. Yeah, 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 he did. I right. thought that was almost over the top, but the, uh, but you know, but I say like that suggests that, that's what we came up with. That's what we got. So when you say 10 grand, it's not going to happen. Like right. we've done the math to here, you know? So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I thought it was a great book. He is very, very good book. I've actually, there are not many books that I've read two or three times. That is the one that I, that is one of them that I, there's so much value in it. Yeah. There's, I think it's just life value on how to maneuver and negotiate. Cause life is a negotiation. He's correct. Say another one that the Jocko book about, um, you know, extreme ownership. I found that was another one. And I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be wild into like, you know, uh, the books are about, you know, certainly you know, whether it be law enforcement, whatever, I, most of the books I read are like right off the Oprah book club. Like I'm, I told you I'm a nerd. Dude. I read the book, I, the, the game of Thrones series is actually called the song of ice and fire. I read that twice. I read the thing. It took me about eight months to read it. And then about three years later, the rumors came out, the new books coming out October, 2015. I reread that whole series getting ready for book six never came out it's 2022 never came out he hasn't written a book since it's got to be at least 2014 but yeah all, all those books i thought the jock alone book was uh comment worthy and i think the i think the voss book was too yeah no, Plus, uh, you take from it you can literally listen to it and go i can take from that you know a book like is, the, a book's a bargain i mean literally i i'm addicted to education once i was actually turned on to it and for me what was great is now the ability to listen to books which is how yeah. I come in significantly more than reading the books. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not as lazy with them. Yeah. I'm probably, I'm probably three for one on audiobook versus reading a book. Like if I'm, I have a book in hand, I've got, I've got, I've done gone through three audiobooks before I'll finish that one there. Um, so yeah. And I, I agreed on that, which is funny because people always trying to uh, get me into like the um, uh, like, you know, they'll, they'll mention like a podcast and these things here. And I'm like, look at, I, I live my life in 20 minute spurts. You know what I mean? Sometimes, you know, I'm driving here, I'm driving there. You find me a podcast of 15, 20 minute chunks and said, I'm, I'm your guy, you know? So it's kind of funny. Like, even I was looking at the one I did with you and uh, Kenny and it was like, you know, 50 minutes. I'm laughing. I'm like, I wouldn't listen to my own podcast. And I was like, <laughs> well, they're good for traffic jobs. So there are people listening great. to their traffic oh, they're great. jobs. Yeah. That's great. Um, but yeah, which is, like I said, um, I know uh, when we spoke last time, I'd said this, but I just really to reiterate the point when uh, we're talking about the gang game and the gun game. And, and as, as you all know, I, I technically, I, for all purposes, I come with three blocks of instruction. I, I shouldn't even call them that, but three presentations. The gang game, the gun game, and the honor game. Um, the gang game, we, you know, we, we, we try that at a few locations, but I just don't think it's, uh, it, it, it appeals as sexy as the gun game. So I'll have you know, 11 people sign up for the gang game and then 95 people sign up for the gun game. So I'm like, okay, like I, I can read the room on that one. So, um, so I'm, although I'm doing one more in September, uh, there's a chance I, I know we were talking about saying I might might try to maybe I will do an on demand or something for that gang game. Uh, the gun game's way too dynamic. That would never work on demand anyway. And plus, it changes way too often. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Way too. Both of our instructors come on to the on demand thing, and 
have to refresh it every six months. That's the thing is, I, it would become an obsession of mine. Like three weeks have passed, and I think of something that I said, and I'm like, I got a way better replacement example for that. I, yeah, I'd never stop. That would be my rabbit hole. I'd never, I'd never come out of it. But, uh, but yeah, but as you and I talked though, um, but putting out, uh, putting out the honor game though, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that one. That's, that falls more in the category of, um, I even made the joke. I said almost the Tom Rizzo category. So it's more about policing in 2022, like real self introspection about, you know, how do we find ourselves in these scenarios, you know, whether it be with our departments or whatever, like when you're telling the story about that officer and saying, you know, he had a fourth amendment issue, you know, that he had to kind of battle that he was now in the soup. It's funny. All I can think when you tell me the story is I'm thinking like he almost has to reflect whether it's worth doing that work at that PD, you know, right, because right. the role is the, the role is we're here to, to, to serve our departments. You know, like I I'm on a police department that, that hired me. They gave me a shot. My job is to serve their mission. If I if they say to me, Tommy, your sole goal right now is these community programs and, you know, and, and, and we want you to be assigned to that. We'll see you later. I, I, I'm all about it. I'm, let's do it. I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to be handing out ice cream cones. I'm going to be, I'm going to give out the best ice cream cones. I'm going to try to find the most dynamic and exciting way to hand out ice cream cones. That's it. If you say to me, Tommy, we're getting crushed with gun violence over here. Well, then I'm going to try to get guns. If you transfer me to a quieter or smaller neighbor that just doesn't have gangs, doesn't have gun violence, then my first question would be, what's the problem? You know, what, what is the problem we face here? When they say, uh, juvenile runaways that I'm going to focus and go to every presentation, every training I can get on juvenile runaways. I'm going to want to be good at that. My point is, is if you're in a small sleepy town, and I don't mean sleepy is an insult, but just from a violent crime standpoint, if you're, if you're working in a town that doesn't have that kind of violent crime and you're out there trying to be the guy who gets guns, I, I think you, you're a misfit already. I think that if then the first time you try it and you swing and you miss and your department says, what are you doing? Like, that's not our focus here. I think you should read the room and get the hint. Either find a PD that matches you better or match the mission, you know? But uh, I, I get that a lot from cops. They'll say like, oh, hey, we're going to a really small town, but like, I really, I go to these trainings. I've been to yours and this. I love it. I'm, I'm always out there looking for guns. And I'm like, you, you're, you're a recipe for a cop to get in trouble because you're looking for something really where no one wants you looking for it because it's either A, not there or B, not a big enough problem that, how about this? No cop has ever been so amazing that their departments were willing to overlook their own opinions. You know, department says, you know, we don't want car chases, but then you got in a car chase and it was so awesome. Yours is fine. You know what I mean? Like that's never happened. You know, if they, if they say it, it's usually because they mean it, you know, <laughs> listen to the words people use. The department says, we don't want this tattoo it in your chest. You know what I mean? And backwards, you can see it in the mirror every day and then don't do it. You know, the cool thing is, that you know, the cool thing is if you don't match the, agency and the way you saw your career, you can leave and go somewhere else. hundred percent. And you, we could just create our own problems. I mean, most cops are unhappy in their job because they have a vision of themselves doing something that the job's not doing. It's funny is if they actually buy into what the job is doing, they might find that they're exceptional at it. They might find it's really, really great, but they wrote a book in their head about the guy they were going to be, the girl they were going to be, the cop they were going to be. And then when they got there, they didn't get to be that. They, they now want to create it. They want to manufacture it. And that's when you find a lot of suspects being stopped without good reason. You know what I mean? You find a lot of people had being offended by, by, you know, the, the suggestion that they've done something wrong when, when they haven't. And I think that's really where that comes from. You know, like you say, you work in an area where there's um, the department supports the work you're doing. And they say, listen, we have whatever, use interdiction as an example, you know, this is a thoroughfare for drug transport. And you're out there doing interdiction, pulling drugs off the street they, they, and they love it. You're in a great place working on interdiction. You know, I, wanted to do a video on Facebook Live. And I'm going to say it here now because it sparked my what I thought over the weekend after talking to this gentleman was people are apprehensive to leave their agencies. But knowing that they have a target on their back or, you know, if they're doing the work that they want to do or envision themselves doing will create problems for them. I want people to balance the apprehension to find a better home, you know, and, and maybe avoid future turmoil versus sticking around and really pushing the edges and pushing it and pushing them. It's the to pushing like, is the problem. It's the pushing is the problem. Sticking yeah. around can be fine, but it's, yeah. you're right. It's the pushing yeah. is the problem. And pushing it to the point where you're going to fire you. And now, you're, now your law enforcement career is over. because you're gonna well, They're fired. not going to cover you on something that they otherwise would have, which could be worse. Well, they're going to fire. I mean, and on top of that, they're going to fire you. You're right. And that's the other thing, too. So, like, this guy's getting fired uh, that's yeah. they, 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 on, on bullshit, but they're going to do everything they can to fire him on it. They're waiting for him to serve them something up. And they took the opportunity to make a point. And yeah. 
you know, now it's, well, I'm looking to transfer. You should have looked three years ago instead right, of pushing right, the envelope right. here because now your career uh, has this, no matter what, for what they did fair or not, it's got this scar on it that you have Sustain, to explain. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. That's true. And like I said, it's, it's, it's funny. The older, the older you get, the longer you're on, the more you realize like in terms like positivity, I just a joke either. You know I mean? Listen, I, 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 I might, you know, sometimes give the impression like many do like, you know, everything's candy land, but make no mistake. I've had, I've had my sad days at work too. You know, yeah. things where, you know, the department's mission and me or another employee and me just, we weren't, we weren't in sync. And like I said, and I'm, I'm sure that I had my day of complaining, maybe my week, maybe my month, you know what I mean? But I can tell you, like, probably better than most, you know, I really have, like, really taken some stock. Like, I, I there's one scenario that comes out with me specifically that was, like, a career trajectory changing, you know, uh, situation for me, you know, at the time when it came to, like, you know, where I was, there was there was an individual that I, I at the time, I thought was, was my problem. You know, and I thought he was breaking my balls. It's funny that, like, really without much fanfare, like, I spoke to him almost like you know, less than a year later. I just cold called him. I, I was the issue. I, I realized it later. I was moving at a speed that I thought he should have been moving at. When in reality, he had a job and I had a job, and I was stepping out of my lane. And I and I, I owned that from the day I, I spoke to him. You know, and um, we, we've all had probably scenarios like that. And again, and mine's not that interesting or that specific even. But my point is, is like it would. I think that a lot of cops who get on here, we write a movie in our head about who we are, who we're gonna be. And anything that stops that is somehow the problem. Instead of really recognizing we're the moving bullet in the story here, you know what I mean? We're, we're the one who could stop, you know? We're the, we're the one who could slow down and try to make sure we're on the right gun, you know? I mean, I was had moments in my career when I was fired, a warning shots were fired at me. And I went, if this is what you're telling me to do, I'll go out yeah. and write a parking ticket a day. Yeah. If you want me to be proactive. And they went, well, that's probably a good idea. I said, okay, yeah. that's what you want. You have and to. unfortunately that was a, uh, that was, I'm a nail in the coffin for some morale at an agency, but that's literally what I was told in a closed door. And, you know, and that's, and that's part of the cycle of life for departments too. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, they, they say, you know, strong times make for weak men, weak men make for weak times, weak times make for strong men, strong men wake for strong times. And like, you know, it, it cycles the, um, departments are going to have the ebb and flow units going to have the ebb and flow. I mean, there are times when morale's down and that's part of the reality. I mean, if you're working in a place that's complete candy, then God bless you, you found it, you know, but I mean, I, I've I've had ten year stretches working in the exact same spot, and uh, in my career, and I can tell you, I, I've I've had to watch it go. You know, I've watched times where you know work was high, morale was high. Other times where the workflow was high, morale was low. Other times where both were low. You know, COVID wrote a whole new book about what things were like. We had we had sometimes two hours of no radio traffic. Do you know what it was like to have like two hours of the radio not traffic? That was just unheard of. Like guys, guys would get on the radio and I'm, I'm talking like a couple of times a night, which is going like, yeah, you know, such and such on a radio check. Yeah, go ahead. You know, other guys are just, you did you just leave here at key guys just want to make sure that their partners, you know, might be you know, keyed up. It's, you can't believe we're not on the wrong channel. So it's, it's interesting though, but yeah, I mean, all storms to weather, all storms to weather. Yeah. All right. We're going to wrap it up here because we have more things to talk about in the future. Great. So, Anything else, Tom? If you want to find out Tommy's classes, streetcop.com is the place. Um, yep. We should have a catchy phrase for you, like the bearded instructor or something. Like I'm that. good. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Kenny told me how he got his nickname. He said, basically, the other one who stuck it to him. He said, it was, I think he said it was like an email joke he'd had. And then when you saw the email, you went, Red Ninja? And he was like, no, it's just an email. You're like, yeah, well, that's not your nickname. He's like, all, all the Red Ninja branding. I, I believe it's what he told me it came from. It was actually you. Well, see, did he tell you the beginning of the Red Ninja when he was in high school? He used to be good with nunchucks. So did he tell you that? He can still do I, I don't. Kenny is one of my favorite people in the world. And there's two things I'm not going to do right now. One of them is tell a story about Kenny that he's not at. So how about this? You keep your nunchuck story. I'm just going to keep it where it's at. I wish <laughs> Kenny was on this podcast with me again here today, man. I don't care that I talk 5,000 words to his one. I love that dude. Yeah, I think everybody loves that guy. He's a good guy. He's worth it. All right, my man. All right, brother. I will see you. All right, be safe, guys.